In the videos this week, I'm going to build up the major results of vector calculus, the theorems of Gauss, Green, and Stokes. Then I'm going to use vector calculus and those theorems to describe the physics of electric and magnetic fields. This is an ambitious goal, but I think we can get there. The theorems I want to get to, to fit the archetype of the fundamental theorem, an archetype that I talked about a couple weeks ago regarding the fundamental theorem of line integrals. So let me remind you of the form. One side is the integral of a derivative, and the other side is the evaluation on a boundary. The evaluation on the boundary so far have been just straight evaluation at points, but it's going to turn out for higher dimensional situations, the right side will always also be an integral. This is the pattern. One side there is a derivative, on the other side there will be a boundary. Doing the integral of the derivative will be the same as doing the integral of the original over some kind of boundary. So to get there, I need to talk about boundaries. This notion of boundary will be a different boundary from the topological boundary that I talked about a little bit earlier in the course. This is a geometric boundary. This boundary is the actual edge of an object. For surfaces, it's where the surface stops. And I'm not going to be more formal than that, but instead I'm going to use examples to illustrate the idea. First, let me start with some familiar objects in R3. The sphere, the cube, the ellipsoid, and the cylinder, including the top and bottom disks. All of these are closed surfaces. And again, this is the geometric closed, which is a bit different from the topological term closed from a few weeks ago. This means that they have well-defined insides and outsides. They close off a region from the rest of R3. If a surface is closed, it has no boundary. There is no edge to the sphere, it just keeps going around. The sh cube has sharp corners and sharp edges, but it has no edge where it just stops. It only has edges where two faces connect. Closed surfaces, surfaces that contain an inside, have no boundary. But what about open surfaces? In R2, any finite solid shape has a boundary, which is the outline of that shape. It's where the shape stops, it's, it's its edge. In R3, if I take a finite height cylinder, but I do not include the top or bottom disks, then what is the boundary? Where does the cylinder stop? It ends at the two circles, at one at the top and one at the bottom. So the boundary is these two circles. So what about a cone instead of a cylinder? Well, the cone closes off to a point at one end. And maybe you could argue that this point is an edge, but that's not the convention we take. This point is more like a point on a cube, which is not a boundary. Instead, the boundary of the cone is just the one circle where it is still open, where it still comes to an end. And similarly, I could consider a half sphere. What is the boundary of a half sphere? The sphere had no boundary, but the hemisphere is cut in half and has an edge where it is cut. The boundary here is another circle, the place where the sphere suddenly stops. That's the idea of boundary. But I need a bit more. Parametric surfaces have orientation. What do I mean by orientation? Well, for a curve, orientation is the direction of the curve. Which point is the end and which point is the start? Which direction do you move along the curve, forward or backward? You can reverse a curve, going backwards instead of forwards, and that would be the reverse orientation. For a surface, the orientation is the direction of the normal. I've already talked about this a little bit. The normal to a surface, including normals to planes from very early in the course, can point above or below the surface. These are two choices. This is the orientation of the surface. It's a choice of what to consider above and what to consider below the surface according to the direction of the normal. A curve always has a well-defined direction. Interestingly, though, not all surfaces actually have proper orientation. Those that do are called orientable surfaces. Some of you might have seen a version of this elsewhere in the famous example of the Mibia strip, which is a non-orientable surface. For the rest of the course, I only want to consider orientable surfaces. All of the examples I've used so far, planes, graphs of scalar fields, surfaces of revolution, spheres, cylinders, cones, all of these are orientable. Now let me put all of this together. I have boundaries and orientation. The boundary of a surface should be a curve. We saw this in the cone in the cylinder. The boundary was a circle or two circles, which are curves. So a surface and its boundary can both be objects with orientation. 
To make sense of the theorems to come this week, I need the orientations to fit. The boundary of a surface will always be a closed curve or several co closed curves, such as a cylinder with two circles. If I know the orientation of the surface, well, that's the direction of the normal. What should be the matching direction of the curve around the edge? This is given by a right-hand rule on the normal. The direction of the bounding curve needs to be counterclockwise when looking down on the surface from the direction of the normal. And this is the notion of compatible boundaries. This is what I need. I know that sur curves and surfaces have orientation. I know that the boundary of a surface is a closed curve. And I now I know that the orientation of the boundary has to match the orientation of the surface by using a right-hand rule to match the rotation of the curve around the normal of the surface.